what I want us to do this uh, afternoon is I want us to give thought to the doctrine of justification, but more specifically, I want us to think especially about what lies at the core and heart of that doctrine, which is the doctrine of imputation. And so let's give thought to that. But as someone who teaches not only systematic theology, but also historical theology or church history, I always like to wind back the clock and I like to take a journey into the past in order so that we can have a good frame of reference so that we can appreciate the truth all the more. And so that being said, let's journey back to the 16th century and to the Council of Trent, which was the Roman Catholic Church's official response uh, to the Protestant Reformation. And it was there in the 1540s in Trent, Italy, that the council met, and one of the first topics that they took up for discussion and debate was the doctrine of justification. There were a number of cardinals there at the council that were somewhat sympathetic to Luther, but there was another Jesuit theologian there by the name of Diego Lanyes, and Lanyes wanted to ensure that Luther's doctrine of justification did not take hold. And so, in response to some of those that were sympathetic to Luther, he arose and from memory gave a three-hour uh, deliberation or a three-hour speech against the doctrine of imputation. Now, briefly stated, the doctrine of imputation, as Dr. Dolzel said in his lecture, is the idea that we receive the obedience and the suffering of Christ that is accredited to our account, and conversely, God accredits to Jesus' account our sin and our disobedience. It's, as Luther once called it, the glorious exchange. And so, Diego Lanyas wanted to make sure that this doctrine didn't take hold in the Roman Catholic Church, and so he spoke against it. And in the midst of that three-hour uh, speech that he gave, he used an illustration, he used a story, and he used this parable of a prince who wanted his servants to fight for and to secure a gem. But he says, for the first one, for the first of his servants, he told his servant, only believe and I, to whom all the king's wealth has been promised, will obtain the gem and freely give it to you. He said that was the first. The second, he said, servant, he told, I'm going to give you money so that you can redeem yourself from servitude, so that you can purchase a horse and weapons, and so that you can fight for the gem. And then there was a third servant in this parable, and he said the third servant was freed uh, from his servitude. Uh, the, the prince ensured his well-being and then gave him the weapons to fight and to win the gem. Well, in, these, in this parable, the three different servants, according to Lanyas, represented the three different views of the doctrine of justification. The first was a pure imputation, only believe and I will grant to you the gem. The second was a combination of both imputation and the idea of inherent righteousness, that is, you secure the gem through your own obedience or you secure your justification, that declaration of your righteousness and conformity to the law through a combination of Christ's righteousness and your righteousness. That was the view that Lanius attributed to a number of the delegates there that was sympathetic to Luther. And then, of course, the third view was the common view of the day, uh, which was that redeemed sinners essentially earned their justified status by the freely given means of the Son. Through faith working through love, they are obedient until they sufficiently achieve a state of justification. Now, in addition to this parable, Lanius also gave a dozen reasons as to why the idea of the imputed righteousness of Christ was erroneous, among which included, it eliminates the merits and the works of believers. And when I read that, I first read that, I was like, yes, that's right. It eliminates the merits and works of believers. But he saw that as a reason to object. Secondly, he says that it excludes personal acts of satisfaction and the doctrine of purgatory. Once again, I wanted to say right on the money, you're right. It does eliminate personal acts of satisfaction as if you could somehow suffer a sufficient penalty in order to somehow atone for your sins. 
he says it removes supposedly the place for inherent righteousness, the idea essentially that you needed to have any personal holiness yourself. It encourages lawlessness, he argued. He argued that it was novel and that Luther essentially had invented the doctrine. Well, on the heels of this three-hour speech that Lanyas gave, the council subsequently voted, and I think in no small measure due to his speech, unanimously rejected the doctrine of imputation. And of course, in those essentially infamous words from the Council of Trent in the sixth session, the council said that if anyone says that people are justified solely by the attribution of Christ's justice or by the forgiveness of sins alone, to the exclusion and the grace and charity which is poured forth in their hearts by the Holy Spirit and abides in them, or even that the grace by which we are justified is only the good will of God, let him be anathema. And so they condemned and put under the anathema of supposedly the church the gospel of Jesus Christ, the doctrine of imputation, the idea that it is Christ's righteousness that saves us and not our own. Well, Trent's condemnation wasn't the first, nor was it the last rejection of the doctrine of imputation. Believe it or not, the Westminster Assembly, there was a very small but nevertheless vocal minority that were against the doctrine of the imputed active obedience of Christ, Christ's perfect law-keeping credited to our account. In the uh, late 17th century, Reformed theologian uh, Richard Baxter, who's famous for his work, the Reformed pastor, also wrote extensively against the doctrine of imputation, so much so that he earned the hearty rebuke of a number of the Westminster divines. It was Charles Finney in the 19th century who said that the doctrine of imputation is an absurdity, and he rejected it. In the 1980s, Norman Shepard, who was a professor of systematic theology at Westminster Theological Seminary in Philadelphia, created a controversy because of his rejection of the doctrine of imputation. For some of you, you remember in the 1990s, there was the Evangelicals and Catholics Together controversy in which Dr. Sproul admirably and courageously stood up against those who uh, failed to um, uh, talk about the importance and the necessity and the absolute uh, fundamental nature of imputation to the doctrine of justification. In the early aughts, there was the Federal Vision controversy where a number of proponents of that uh, particular point of view rejected the doctrine of imputation. Or more recently, one such as Peter Lightheart has claimed in his recently published book, The End of Protestantism, that Roman Catholics and Protestants essentially need to, to come together because he says, quote, neither side has really grasped the depth of the biblical teaching on justification. Uh, I beg to differ with all due respect. And what he says essentially is that you can imagine that with the pressures that are pushing in on the church, the cultural pressures, where it seems as if Christianity and all of the cultural mores of the Judeo-Christian understanding of, uh, of life are seemingly just withering under the hot sun of secularism, that the pressure would be on for us, yes, let's really concentrate on what really matters and let's set this one aside. Again, Lightheart says, in general, I'm urging my tribe to go out, grow out of its tribalism. It's time to bring Protestantism to its end by turning Protestants into Reformational Catholics. So there are calls. Let's not fight. Let's try to get along because there are fewer and fewer of us in the trench. And yet, over the years, there have also been a faithful number of theologians who have said that imputation is vital not merely to the doctrine of justification, but really to the very existence of the church. It was Dr. Sproul who once wrote, this is the very heart of the gospel. In order to get into heaven, will I be judged by my righteousness or by Christ's righteousness? If I have to trust in my righteousness to get into heaven, I must completely and utterly despair of any possibility of ever being redeemed. But when we see that it, the righteousness that is ours by faith is the perfect righteousness of Christ, we see how glorious and good the gospel really is. The good news is simply this. 
I can be reconciled to God. I can be justified, not on the basis of what I can do, but on the basis of what has been accomplished by Christ for me. This is a truth worth dividing the church. So to push back against this tide, this tide and the, the, the continual call to unite and to set aside some of these supposedly dispensable truths, we want to look to the scriptures because as much as we appreciate and we uh, uh, understand and really love Dr. Sproul for his courageous defense of the gospel, we always want to go back to the scriptures as he would want us to, to recognize that this is the teaching of scripture and this is really what lies at the heart of the Protestant Reformation. That is the teaching of the scripture and the gospel. We want to once again drink from the life-giving water to renew our minds, as Dr. Sproul would say, to see that scripture teaches the double imputation, uh, uh, that is, of our sin to Christ and Christ's sin to, to or sorry, Christ's righteousness to us. And so in order to, to see this, I want us to look to a passage perhaps that many of us might not regularly meditate upon, and that's the third chapter of Zechariah, chapter three of Zechariah, and we're going to look at the first five verses, Zechariah chapter three, verses one through five. So you want to turn there to, to, because we're going to be making reference to it. And we're going to see that from this passage of Scripture, that imputation lies at the heart of the gospel and our salvation. And as Dr. Spohl has rightly said, this is the article upon which the church stands or falls because it's the article upon which we all stand or fall. And so first what we'll do is we'll look at the setting. It's important that we understand the setting of this passage. Secondly, we want to take note of the presence of the accuser, which in Hebrew is ha-satan, the, 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 the Satan, the accuser. And then third and finally, we want to look at the gift and the nature of the blessing that we see unfolded in this passage. So first, the setting. Zechariah prophesied during a time of the Babylonian exile when Israel was set to return to the land. Cyrus, the Persian king, issued a decree that Israel's leaders would be allowed to return to the land so that they could see about rebuilding the city and most importantly, the temple that uh, lay at its heart. And so this required that they would not only rebuild the temple, but restart the sacrifices as well as re, uh, reestablish the line of Levitical priests because as they were in exile, they did not have the means, the place, or even the priestly order uh, to carry out those vital and necessary sacrifices. Most importantly, without a high priest, Israel could not present that important sacrifice on the Day of Atonement that we read about in Leviticus chapter 16, where the high priest would be the representative of the people, enter into the Holy of Holies to offer the sacrifices to ensure God's abiding presence in their midst. But given this point in Israel's history, because of the exile, because of the destruction of the temple, uh, because of the fact that Israel had sinned and grievously so, so much so that it warranted their ejection from the promised land, we can say that the priestly line was defiled. They couldn't offer sacrifices on the nation's behalf. And so even though the people are, in a sense, returning to the land and therefore they're going to be in much closer to proximity to God's presence than they ever have been when they were in the exile, there's still a sense in which they are, they are miles away from God because there are no priests, there are no sacrifices, and therefore they are still alienated from God. So this brings us to our second point which is the accuser's presence. So what happens here is that Zechariah sees a vision, a vision that unfolds in the very presence of God, in the very throne room of God. And it begins with the priest, Joshua, standing in the presence of the Lord, as we read in Zechariah 3.1, as well as the accuser. Now Joshua was standing before the angel, clothed with filthy garments. Now, this is a place where the, where the English translation, I think, veils what's really going on, and I'm not saying it does so deliberately, 
but it's simply there's, there's more to it than what the English lets on. I don't know about you, but I've been filthy before. You know, you're out in the yard and you're doing yard work. Uh, I, 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 blessedly, when we moved to Mississippi, I told my wife, find the tiniest yard that you can because I don't like yard work. I don't have a green thumb, I've got a brown thumb, okay? And so I go out there and I have to, I have a lot of trees, so I, I have a yard vacuum and I vacuum up the leaves and bag them. But in the process, I just get covered in, in dust from head to toe. That might be the idea that we're thinking about when we read that Joshua, Joshua was clothed in filthy garments. It's far, far worse than that. You see, the term that we read there for filthy is the same term that God uses in Deuteronomy chapter 23, verses 13 and 14, when he instructed the Israelites that they were to bury their excrement, their waste, because he said, I walk in your midst, and therefore your camp should not be defiled. You need to bury your waste, your human waste. Otherwise, it will render the camp as unclean and unholy, and I can't be in your midst. The ESV in Isaiah 28.8 renders the term as vomit. In Isaiah 36, verse 12, it, it renders it as dung. At least in terms of Old Testament ritual purity, being covered in human waste is about as defiled as you can get. But I think that there's another factor that's likely going on here. You know, think about it. I suspect that Joshua, as a faithful high priest, was well aware of Israel's history. He was well aware of the Levitical code and the requirements for the absolute cleanliness and purity of the high priest. He had to bathe according to the, the protocols of the Day of Atonement. He had to ensure that he was in pure garments, that his underclothes were absolutely clean. I think that he would have been undoubtedly aware of what happened when two priests by the name of Nadab and Abihu, went into the Lord's presence, undoubtedly clothed as they were supposed to be clothed, but with unauthorized fire, and God struck them dead. It wouldn't surprise me in the least to know that the filth, the human waste that was on the garments of Joshua the high priest were perhaps not only external to him, but they were the products of his own fear. In fact, they say that in doing research, or in, in researching what happens to soldiers in combat, that when human beings are faced with profound and immediate fear, that they lose control over their bodily functions and that it's a natural occurrence. In fact, they, they did a study of soldiers in World War II uh, where it said that a third of all soldiers in combat were willing to admit that they had lost control of the bodily function when the bullets started flying and the bombs started dropping. And the study researchers also said that the other two-thirds were probably lying. But if you know who God is, that he is holy, 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 and you know who you are, utterly sinful, not to mention the fact that you are appearing in the presence of this all-holy God, just covered in waste, human waste. It would not surprise me in the least that you would lose control of your bodily functions as you trembled in fear knowing that God would have every right to condemn you right on the spot, knowing that the accuser would not have to lie and that he would not have to invent charges, but that he could just simply say, look at him. He is stained in human excrement. He is covered in waste. He is sinful. And that the verdict and that the accusation would be true. That's why I think 
Joshua would have stood in the presence trembling with great fear. Trembling knowing that the verdict would be coming. Again, verse 1, Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. I liken the scene unto the prisoner being led up to the guillotine and being lowered and having the collar drop down and with the executioner's arm on the rope. This brings us to our third and final point, which is the gift. But before the accuser can open his mouth, I think we read <laughs> some of the most glorious words in all of Scripture. The Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, O Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is this not a brand plucked from the fire? Hear God's words of mercy. This cool stream of grace flows out to extinguish the righteous hot flames of God's just wrath and the true words of the accuser. And now Joshua can stand boldly in the presence of God but notice what the Lord does not do is he does not challenge the presumable words that would come from the accuser. But the Lord nevertheless rebukes Satan and he rebukes him by invoking his own name. How is this possible? How can the Lord invoke the Lord? Well, I think the imagery is a little bit vague, but in the light of the rest of Scripture, as we see it progressively unfold, we can read, for example, from the psalmist himself that ultimately what, what Zechariah sees in this vision is that God himself is not only judge, but is also his defense attorney, his advocate. And in the language that we see of Psalm 110, verse 1, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. It is Jesus Christ who comes to Joshua's defense to intercede and to advocate on his behalf and who rebukes the accuser in the name of the Lord. And he rebukes him by saying that the Lord has chosen Jerusalem. In other words, it is Joshua who stands as the representative on behalf of Jerusalem, the people and the nation. And in spite of their defilement, he nevertheless is going to show them mercy. What an amazing thing. I mean, when you think about it, it's, it's, it's enough to make you slack-jawed. The Lord has plucked Israel, represented by Joshua, from the fire of his judgment and condemnation. But Jesus does not merely write off Joshua's defiled state. He doesn't ignore his excrement-stained garments that ultimately are representative of his sin. Instead, amazingly so, he gives Joshua a gift And it's the Lord's words that set off a chain reaction. The angels directed those standing near Joshua to remove his excrement-stained garments. But notice what this means. He says there at the begin, in the middle of verse 4, he says, Behold, I have taken away your iniquity from you. Remember what Dr. Dolzel just said in his lecture. So often the problem with sin is that we don't think it's that big of a problem. But oh, wouldn't we think it was a problem if the Lord decided to show us what our sin looked like by giving us garments that were analogous to the state of our souls apart from Christ. We would be clothed in those garments stained with human waste. But if the stained garments are symbolic of sin, then the converse is true, is that pure garments reveal righteousness, holiness, obedience to the law. 
And so he says, I will clothe you with pure, with pure vestments. I'm taking away those stained garments, those filthy garments that are just covered in waste. I'm removing them from you and I am giving to you these pure garments. They are clean. They are holy. In the conceptual thought world of the temple, the priestly garments were made of the same material as the tabernacle, and they were a constant reminder for holiness, the need for righteousness. In the words of Isaiah the prophet, and he says in Isaiah chapter 61 verse 10, where the prophet says, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exult in my God, for he has clothed me in the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decks himself like a priest with a beautiful headdress and a bride adorns herself with her jewels. What a reversal of fortunes. A reversal of the outcome. What an amazing gift. The one thing that Joshua deserved was condemnation. And yet God graciously gives him pure vestments, pure garments. We can say from the rest of scripture that these garments are a robe far greater than Joseph's coat of many colors. These garments are the pure and holy garments, the the robe of the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that he clothes them in these pure garments. In technical terms, it's an imputation. God is crediting. He's saying to Joshua, give me your sin-stained garments and I will give you the robe of my son so that you can appear boldly in my presence without trembling, without fear, but with joy, with happiness, with great, with, with, with great rejoicing because I've taken away your sin. But yet what what Zechariah doesn't talk about, because every single passage doesn't necessarily address every single aspect of, of a doctrine, is that what happened to those sin stained garments? I mean, I, I, I suspect all of us have been there if we've ever raised a small child. Sometimes when you're changing the child, I'll just, I I would tell my wife, you know what? I'm not even going to try on this one. Let's just throw it away. You just get rid of it. It's beyond cleaning, you know? Just like not even going to try. Let's just, you know, dump it, burn it. (laughs) So we might think, well, what happened to the garments? Well, they must have been carried outside the camp and they must have been burned. But yet from that same patch of scripture that Dr. Dolzel was reading from in Romans chapter 5, we begin to see what happened to those sin-stained garments. The Apostle Paul in Romans 5, 17, he says, For if because of one man's trespass death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification in life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience the many were constituted sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be constituted righteous. It's because of Christ's work that we are constituted righteous. God puts us into the category of righteous, perfectly obedient to the law, holy and just, because we wear the robe of his Son. But what Paul is also implying here, we'll unpack this in greater detail in a moment, is that Paul is also implying here that what happens because of the the sin of the one, for those who receive the robe of Christ, it is Christ who wears their sin-stained robe. But we receive this robe not because God says as in the parable of the Jesuit theologian at Trent, here, I've freed you, now here's some material, make your own robe. 
Or he doesn't say, okay, I'll give you some money by which you can then go and buy a robe. He just gives him the robe. In the words of the Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter 11, paragraph 1, it says, those whom God effectually calls, he also freely justifies, not by infusing righteousness into them. In other words, it's not because we're justified, because we ourselves are inherently righteous, but by pardoning their sins, remove his filthy garments, and by accounting and accepting their persons as righteous, I give to you pure vestments. But listen to these series of qualifications, not for anything wrought in them or done by them, but for Christ's sake alone, nor by imputing faith itself, the act of believing, or any other evangelical obedience to them as their righteousness, but by imputing the obedience and satisfaction of Christ unto them, they receiving and resting on Him and His righteousness by faith. Which faith? They have not in themselves. It is the gift of God. Do you hear what they're saying there? They're saying it's not you. It's Christ. It's because Christ has saved you. It's because Christ has given to you the robe of His righteousness to wear, even though you didn't deserve it. Christ takes our filthy gar- or God takes our filthy garments and He gives them to Christ. Think of that. Our Savior, who is perfectly holy and righteous, was willing to put on your sin-stained garments. God imputes our sin to Christ, which means that He also, therefore, bears the penalties for wearing those sin-stained garments. He bears the curse of the covenant. It was Gerhardus Voss, the, the famous Princeton biblical theologian, that said that the Old Testament counterpart to the apostle Paul uh, was Isaiah, and that Paul is the New Testament counterpart to Isaiah. You know, when I, when, we, when I get to heaven, I want to find Paul. I mean, after, of course, uh, finding Jesus. And I'm sure I won't have to find him. He'll find me. And I want to ask him, you had Isaiah opened up, didn't you, when you were writing Romans? And I suspect that it wasn't just the fact that he had the scroll laid open. I've heard it on more than one occasion that many Jewish rabbis have the entirety of the Old Testament memorized in Hebrew. I think he must have had the scroll of Isaiah unfolded in his mind as he was writing Romans 4 and Romans 5, among others. But what is it that we read of in Isaiah? Isaiah chapter 53, in that famous fourth servant song, verses 11 and 12, out of the anguish of his soul he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous and he shall bear their iniquities. Do you hear it? Do you hear the traffic going in different directions? He makes many to be accounted righteous. And conversely, he bears our sins. Therefore, Isaiah says, I will divide him a portion with the many and he shall divide the spoil with the strong because he poured out his soul to death and he was numbered with the transgressors. That's imputation. And he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. This, this, what is amazing about Isaiah's language here in Isaiah 53 is he has taken up the very language of Leviticus chapter 16 and the Day of Atonement when the high priest would go before the scapegoat and he would take his hands and confess over the goat the sins of the nation and then someone would take that goat and lead it away into the wilderness. And in later Jewish tradition, they would take the the goat and then they would make sure it, it, it found its way over a cliff because they didn't want it coming back. Why? Because the goat bore their sins. 
And if the sins came walking back into the camp on the back of that goat, it would spell a most certain doom for the nation. But do you see the big difference here with Isaiah as he picks up this language from Leviticus 16 when he says that he was numbered with the transgressors and that he bore our sins. Isaiah is saying that it is no mere animal, but it is the Son of God who bears our sins. And so Paul takes these beautiful Isaianic themes these themes that have roots that stretch all the way back into the earliest portions of the Scripture and the Pentateuch and the book of Leviticus, and he can say quite powerfully yet succinctly in 2 Corinthians 5.21, for our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The same way in which he becomes sin it's by imputation, is the same way in which we become the righteousness of God, by imputation. Beloved in Christ, this is a gift that the church has long cherished. In the earliest days in the second century, there was a theologian uh, that wrote a letter. We don't know who he wrote, uh, what, what his name was, but he wrote it, and he wrote it to a man by the name of Dionysus. It's from the second century, one of the earliest recording, uh, recorded letters uh, that, that speak of the doctrine of imputation. In this letter, he says, but God was patient. He bore with us, and out of his pity, he took his, our sins upon himself. He gave up his own son as a ransom for us, the holy one for the lawless, the innocent one for the wicked, the righteous one for the unrighteous, the imperishable one for the perishable, the immortal one for the mortal. For what else could hide our sins but the righteousness of that one? How could we who were lawless and impious be made upright except by the Son of God alone? Oh, the sweet exchange. You see what, what he's saying there? You know, there's another sense in which we can ad- approach this truth, and that is from the, the truth of marriage. And I think that this is one of the themes that Luther uh, uh, wrote upon when he uh, exposited the book of Galatians, when he talked about this glorious exchange. He says that as we are married, as we are married to Christ, everything that is ours becomes his, and everything that is his becomes ours. Our sin becomes his. His righteousness becomes ours. And he says, is this not a beautiful, glorious exchange by which Christ, who is holy, innocent, and holy, not only takes upon himself another sin that is my sin and guilt, but also clothes and adorns me, who am nothing but sin with his own innocence and purity. Indeed, it is a glorious exchange. And it's a, it's, it's a glorious exchange that should fill our hearts with joy. We should be thrilled when we hear this, knowing that we no longer have to stand trembling in the presence of our thrice holy God because of the work of the Son on our behalf. And so, beloved, at the heart of justification is this great and glorious exchange. It is a truth that imparts hope in the face of sin. When you think of your sin, remember that you stand in the presence of an almighty and holy God and that you are worthy of condemnation and you are worthy of the indictment of the accuser. Yet in his mercy, no matter how awful your sin, no matter how many Uh, Christ takes your sin-stained robes and he gives you the robe of his perfect righteousness and holiness. And how is it that you receive this? This is one thing that Diego Lanez got right when he said that when the king and the prince say, here, I give you this gem freely if only you believe. He knew what he was rejecting. How is it that we are righteous and holy By grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. 
And so, beloved in Christ, imputation imparts to us the greatest of hopes because in it Christ cries out, come everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and he who has no money, come buy and eat, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. As we sang moments ago, nothing in my hands I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. Naked come to thee for dress, helpless look to thee for grace. Foul I to the fountain fly, wash me, Savior, or I die. But as much as the gospel is a shelter for all of us individually, as Dr. Sproul said, it also lies at the very foundation of the church. And so any so-called church that condemns the doctrine of imputation is no church at all. It's an imposter. It's a charlatan. As Dr. Sproul rightly pointed out when the evangelicals and Catholics together controversy unfolded, that that document let out, left out that all-important alone. The, doc, the document said, we're justified by grace through faith in Christ. Everybody believes that. It's grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. In his book, I want to say that similarly, Peter Lightheart misrepresents what the true marks of the church are. He says of the Roman Catholic Church, the church engages in the pure preaching of the, or, uh, sorry, he says a body, a, a church is a body of people who profess the gospel, celebrate the Christian sacraments, and enforce Christian behavior. And so th then he says, in fundamental ways, the Roman Catholic Church self-evidently exhibits these marks. They confess the gospel, which is the narrative of Israel, incarnation, death, and resurrection. He says, well, they, they confess it. And yet, if we look at our doctrinal standards, such as the Belgic Confession, the Belgian Confession, which is a, one of the three forms of unity in the continental reform tradition, it doesn't say that the people profess, it has to say that, it says that the church has to profess the doctrine. It says in Article 31, no, sorry, 29, the church engages in the pure preaching of the gospel. It makes use of the pure administration of the sacraments as Christ instituted them. It practices church discipline for the correcting of faults. The church has to purely preach the gospel, not that the people profess the, the, the gospel. Rome cannot claim uh, to preach the pure gospel if it has explicitly condemned the doctrine of imputation and justification by faith alone. If there's ever to be unity, they have to go back and fix what they said. Reject it. Burn it. But even if the culture around us is rapidly collapsing, to try to build unity on a foundation, an empty foundation of feigned agreement, is simply an exercise in verbal virtuosity. That's merely to pay lip service to Christ. To use an oft-used phrase of Dr. Sproul, it's a fool's errand. And while it may be alarming to see our culture reject Judeo-Christian mores, as well as even the Christian faith itself, the worst that can happen is that we'll return to a culture that was like that of the Apostles' Day in the first century, one that was rife with idolatry, and it was still nevertheless a culture in which the gospel could thrive. Yes, in such a context, the church may suffer, but we must remember the indestructible power of the word of God and Christ's, Christ's promise to the church that the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. So to that end, beloved in Christ, Protestants and Catholics can't drive the car of unity as they listen to uh, kumbaya on the radio so long as the doctrine of justification is bound and gagged in the trunk so that it can't interfere with the journey. Unity be damned if we sacrifice the truth of the gospel because it's no unity at all. And so as Dr. Sproul said, the doctrine of justification is a truth worth dividing the church because it lies at the heart of the gospel 
And it's only the imputed righteousness and holiness of Christ that can give us confidence so that we can smile in the face of death. We can say with J. Gresham Machen, as he said with his last dying breaths, I'm so thankful for the active obedience of Christ. No hope without it. And we can heartily say with Dr. Sproul, this indeed is the article upon which the church stands or falls because it is the article on which we all stand or fall. Let's bow together in a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you for the robe of the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that you have given this robe to us as a free gift and that you have taken our sin-stained garments and you have placed them upon your Son and that he has borne the wrath and curse that we so rightly deserve. Oh, Father, we pray that indeed you would enable us to lay down our idols, that we would lay down every effort of ours to try to bring something in our hands, that you would empty our hands so that we would hold fast to the perfect holiness and righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ, that we would rest, receive, and accept that gift by faith alone in him, by your grace alone. Give us the courage to stand for this truth, no matter how unpopular it may become, that we would be faithful unto you and bring glory to your name. We pray and ask all of these things in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you.